Welcome to Peer to Peer, the podcast, brought to you by Raina. Listen in as we hear from top surgeons having great conversations with their peers about hot and popular topics in ophthalmology. In this episode of Peer to Peer, the podcast, Dr. Ben LaHood sits down with ophthalmic legend, Professor Graham Barrett, who has made an extensive contribution to ophthalmology, including Rayner's Ray1 EMV Enhanced Monofocal IOL. Dr. Ben LaHood, refractive cataract and laser vision correction surgeon from Australia, has gained international recognition for his extensive research on astigmatism management and biometry, which is regularly shared around the world. Professor Graham Barrett is a consultant ophthalmic surgeon at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital and a clinical professor in the University of Western Australia's Centre for Ophthalmology and Visual Science. Let's dive in. Welcome to another peer-to-peer podcast hosted by Rainer. I'm your host, Dr. Bin Lahut. Today, we're discussing the development of Ray1 EMV, the delicate balance of blending near and far vision, biometry, and so much more with ophthalmic legend, Professor Graham Barrett. Welcome, Professor Barrett. I've been trying to interview for a long time now. Uh, My hunt is over so I can retire happily. (laughs) And it's a shame for two pseudo-Australians to have to meet overseas. But thank you very much for joining me for a chat. It's a pleasure, Ben. And uh, even though we've been planning this for a few years now, it's just time and distance. But what a pleasure that we've actually finally made it. Kicking things off right from the start. Can you give us the background of the development of the EMV lens? It's probably a huge question, but even just starting with whose idea was it? Was it you that approached Rainer thinking there's a gap in our optics knowledge there? Or did Rainer say, hey, we'd like your help with this? So the concept for me grew out of, well, how can I get that additional spectacle independence without venturing into the compromise? which is evident in so many other optical solutions. And um, more than a decade ago, I came to the conclusion there was a limit to what you could do. And realistically, if we respect that limit, which maintain good quality, um, you still have to add something in addition to get that further reading ability. And that was an element of my opium. So I was looking for a solution that would enable that. And when you think about optics, that ends up being uh, extended depth of focus, or if you call it monofocal plus, I think that's an artificial division anyway, but, um, and then what type of extended depth of focus goes best with a modest level of myopia is positive spherical aberration. So that journey extended well beyond my uh, partnership with Rayner. And I worked with other companies, uh, refining the concepts, doing clinical studies. Um, If you've done any innovation, particularly in RLs, um, the ideas are fascinating and reducing to practice is fascinating, but finding uh, a partner and you really need to do that to make it uh, a reality that other people can use and enjoy uh, is often what's missing. So just delighted to find the synergy uh, with Rainer. And it takes um, a vision for a company to accept that limitation as well, mm. because everybody wants more. And uh, for Rainer to say, yes, they respect that quality of vision as being paramount and engage with the concept of uh, using what is one vision in synergy. Uh, not all companies would do that. And it doesn't mean that it has to be used with one, but it's a nice synergy between mm. technology and getting additional benefits. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think uh, when I was young and foolish, I used to make fun of monovision uh, because I thought that multifocality made more sense. But uh, they're my most troublesome patients, are the diffractive <laughs> trifocal patients. And I'm slowly learning. I'm a slow learner. Yeah. Everyone's got a tolerance for the unhappy patient. Mm. 
mine is um, very low. Yeah, I quite like, like to be things. liked. Yes, <laughs> yeah, um, I agree. the The lens itself. Uh, there've been a few different EDOF or extended depth of focus or monofocal plus lenses released over the past few years. It's been a popular space, and not all of them are easy to understand how they work. Um, I know that this is a brief podcast episode, sure. but can you give us a, a rough idea uh, for the, the lay person in ophthalmology, how the lens actually gives you that extended depth? So Ben, the rain and lens is, could be regarded as a newcomer, but my interest uh, preceded extended depth of focus lens. I coined the term about 10 years ago called mm. EDF, not EDF. Mm. And when I looked at First of all, the concept of extended depth of focus. I look at all the technology that was available, and you can do it in a variety of ways. You can do it using diffractive technology, and that includes low add bifocals, which some companies do, or low add trifocals, one and a half add trifocals. Even phase shift technology, which other companies are mm. using, is a diffractive uh, technology. Essentially, I think it's diffractive, it but is. some would argue, yeah. Well, my my research at the time, I looked into it. I even met uh, one of the inventors of that uh, phase shift technology and thought, well, maybe I'll go that route. But eventually I said, well, I'm not going to go that route. Pinhole optics were an mm -hmm. option, asymmetrical, rotationally asymmetrical optics. Mm -hmm. But really, the one that appealed to me most was an aspheric optic. And um, when I looked at it in more detail, it became apparent that positive aspheric aberration was the better solution. Um, and we can talk a bit later if you like, but there's several good reasons why positive aspheric aberration is preferred. So what you have in an aspheric optic, so all the rays are not brought to one point to focus because the uh, radius of that optic um, tends to get, with that with positive, it tends to get steeper as you go towards the periphery. And um, it's that spread of foci, if you like, continuous, but the spread, which gives you that extra depth of focus. The reason for positive is uh, several fold. Um, firstly, probably it's more physiological. Than, I mean, we're designed for positive. We have um, receptor alignment, which diminishes the impact. And although on an optical bench, you may determine that no aberration is preferred, mm. in a human eye, the, people who have the very best vision have a small amount of positive spherical aberration. Maybe it's the curved retina, mm. but there's something about the biological system which is different than the optical bench. The other reason, when you implant a lens and you say, I've centered it and it looks centered, it may not be centered. There's always going to be some decentration. And positive spherical aberration is very robust to decentration. And uh, it's the opposite for negative spherical aberration, which is exquisitely sensitive. So the MTF drops off quite dramatically uh -huh. with even relatively minor decentration as opposed to positive spherical aberration, uh, which is more robust. If you want to go into exquisite optics. I would uh, like to. I don't know if listeners want to, but, <laughs> but uh, why don't we give it a go? Well, it's, it's, it's easy. So when you think of extended depth of focus and you do a uh, through a depth of focus curve yes. and you extend it, it's not symmetrical. You know, like the little peak. Mm. It's not that the peak expands symmetrically. It's got a um, asymmetry to that curve. Now, with positive spring liberation, the greater spread, the asymmetry if you like, or the slant in that peak is towards more reading vision. Mm -hmm. And it's the opposite with negative spherical aberration. So if you want to have a bias, have it towards better reading. And that's the case with positive as well. Mm -hmm. 
And then the last uh, key thing is that negative defocus or myopia and positive spherical aberration are synergistic. They actually give you better vision than either aberration alone. Negative spherical aberration interferes constructively with hyperopia, but that's not where you want to be in because most of our patients, we tend to rather have a little bit myopic. And if you're going to use uh, monovision to help you, mm -hmm. even minus a half, minus three quarters, that synergy is more likely with positive rather than uh, negative reverberation. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I, I think that's the first time someone has answered the question, aren't all aberrations aberrations? You know, you don't want aberrations in your vision. Why would I want to add spherical aberration? I don't think anyone's ever explained to me, well, positive spherical aberration may be beneficial. Yeah. Thank you. I could have made it simpler and I would say positive is good, <laughs> negative is bad. <laughs> I am a Kiwi, so uh, uh, dumbing it down is good. Um, and so that what you just said also leads into the next part of planning to use the EMV lens, which with a lot of multifocal lenses, we're sort of learning you need to aim slightly hyperopic for best outcomes. And no one really knows why. And um, I've spoken to Damien Gatineau about this, who I think really understands optics. And even he says, I don't know why. Um, with the EMV lens, it sounds as though aiming perhaps first minus or just a little bit of myopia, even for your emotropic eye, would be the way to go? Uh, yes, it, it would be. So you would treat it like a normal monofocal. You're not going to target plus a half for the normal monofocal. Now, this is assuming you've got the right lens constant then, but if you've optimized your constant and you've got the right lens constant, um, your first eye should be uh, plano or tiny, the first minus, not much, because hopefully you're going to be considering some myopia in your second eye when you get your first target. Yep. And that's up to you whether you go for the same target, um, you know, with obviously perfect distance in both, but some expansion of um, reading and excellent intermediate, or whether you want to push it further. And that's up to the surgeon. Yeah. Is it minus minus three quarter, minus one, minus one and a quarter? They're all compatible. But um, when I talk about modest monovision, one of the foundations was always do the first eye for distance. And um, because that's the most important thing. That's your patient loves you already. And I think that's what we're you, judged on. Yeah, and yeah. they're going to love you more when you do the second one. But yeah. Some people have the opposite. They think, well, I'll do my first one for my own mm -hmm. and I'll work out what I get. But no. No, I agree. I think I've been doing this sort of inefficient thing, but it works well for me where I do the first eye for emetropia. If they come back and they say, look, that's everything I've ever wanted. I've got distance. I've got intermediate. I can look at my phone. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy. I do exactly the same again um, because I think, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, but if they say, look, I, I'd like more reading, that's when I aim for myopia, for the second eye. Uh, people love practical feedback, especially from you. Uh, do you, I know that with monovision, standard monovision, you usually aim minus 1.25. Do you adjust for the EMV lens? Do you aim a little bit less myopic with this lens? You, you'll get more for the same level of myopia and you'll impact your distance less. Um, I think maybe minus one will suffice, um, but that's very close to what you <laughs> <laughs> I only I was that precise, yeah. yeah. But then I do similar to what you do, except I push it a little bit further. I always do what the patient wants. But the super happy patient, he says, this is the best thing ever, I'm delighted. I say, yes, but hang on, let me show you but wait, there's more. what you're choosing. And I bring up my spectral frame with an occluder in one and plus one and a quarter in the other. And of course, the plus one and a quarter, I'm testing the eye that's just been done. And I, and I show them and I say, look, first without anything, you've got great distance. And if you try and read and give them the reading script and um, I show them that they can't read, however delighted they are. 
And I said, um, but that's okay. You can wear Reapers. And that's your one choice. Make it the same as the one we just done. Or what we can do, Dr. Trifram and I drop the plus one and a quarter, and I look at you just and say, oh, that's not so good. Or they'll say, I can't see anything, mm. which is not true. <laughs> I said, but now why would we do that? And I'll show them, now look where you can read. I think, oh, I can read perfectly. And I say, well, yes, you can, but it's not here. And I push it right up, you know, mm. three inches away. It's not that kind of reading. Mm. It's mainly, you know, I think you still need some readers occasionally. I can promise them that. And I say, what would you like? And now the super happy patient sits there and says, hmm, yeah. <laughs> I'm not so sure. What would you do? And I say, look, I'm not having a surgery. Mm. So I will make them choose. But I'll show them exactly. And I say, remember, it's not just reading. It's everything you do. When you look in the mirror in the morning and you shave. Mm. Or when you're cooking on the desktop. Yeah. And driving your car. And um, the ones that actually say, no, I want both distance, drops to about uh, 10, 20%. The yeah. vast majority will choose it. When, but you have to point it out to them. Yeah. I think people who come and say, look, I don't read, mm. don't realize that that's not what I'm talking about. Exactly. You don't read. I, but to be honest, I don't read that many books, yeah. but I do do a lot of near tasks. Yes. And um, I, what I don't give them a choice about is getting rid of their astigmatism because there's no benefit. So I mean, I don't even bother saying, well, there's a toric lens. And use it. Yeah. And to perform best, yeah. no matter whether you're targeting distance in both monovision yeah. or either or whatever. That's one aberration you must get rid of. You just, yeah, I don't give them a choice. Yeah. Oh, really. no, I agree. I'm the same. And that was one huge benefit of moving from New Zealand to Australia was we don't even talk about it. The cost yeah, isn't an issue. It's good. And, and people will say, well, guys, you, you're lucky. You're lucky. Yeah. Insurance pays. But you know what? If I was going to charge anything extra, yeah. I wouldn't mind charging extra too because we do more work. We do more yeah. planning. So um, I would be tormented to earn more money by putting a multifocal. <laughs> yeah. But not, not a toric. Not a toric. No, I so agree I completely. I don't see that as an excuse. They have to build it more. <laughs> now, you know, uh, both of us agree that putting in a toric <laughs> is, uh, it just goes, you wouldn't even tell the patient. I, I don't tell the patient, but I'm just doing the best for them. You also hear with different lenses that people will say, well, I just put it in as my monofocal. I don't even tell the patient they're getting anything special. I'm not quite as comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. I think that if you've got a lens that does something special, you should tell the patient they're getting something special because there's usually a drawback. Do you put in the EMV as your just go-to lens? Is there any discussion with the patient? And do you still use monofocal lens? Then until recently, in fact, even now, we don't have a toric widely available. I mean, torics are available, but they're still negotiating mm. with authorities. And, and so when I look at a lens, of course, one of my considerations is uh, reading. But I'm also acutely aware of the area of the And so for me, at this point in time, um, that's paramount. So um, having the toric mm. supersedes some of the other things. Now we're getting to a point, and I have put some in already, and the uh, Rayner EMV toric is great. Mm. And I could see that becoming my only lens. Yeah, that makes sense. Um the other issue that I've run into with EDOF lenses, and not the EMV particularly, but has been when I've put in uh, uh, an EDOF lens in the first eye, aimed for emotropia, they've had a good range of vision, and then they've come back and said, look, I really want reading vision. I'd really like to be able to read. And I think, oh, gee, I don't know if I can guarantee that with an EDOF lens. I've put in a monofocal toric for uh, near, near aim for the second eye, and they've come back and said, oh, wow, that's really crisp. I love that. Do you think that the EMV is detrimental to quality of vision in terms of getting that real crisp, sharp vision? Because you are giving a depth of focus. Something has to give. Um, 
people would say there's no free lunch, can't eat your cake and eat it. Yeah. Um, I like the saying, can you gain without pain? <laughs> yeah. And surprisingly enough, and it's not just my experience, but as more and more people in plant this lens, you really can't detect that you're doing anything less than you would get from a quality point of view and crispness of vision. Uh, when you use the Ray 1 EV, that's not the same for some of the other EDOF lenses. Mm. There is a softness, and we hear people talk about that. Um, I don't think that was, is the case uh, with Ray And it's just purely by that compromise, if you like, of not trying to be greedy and not trying to do too much and staying in the range of good quality vision and getting something. Mm. Um, it's really hard to detect. And that goes down to contrast sensitivity as well, uh, not just the topic, but um, scotopic as well. You really got to struggle yeah. to show you actually using something. That's good to hear. So you still will get that wow factor of 6.5 vision um, and crisp vision. I've been putting them in. Uh, I've had some young patients recently where they're not having surgery in their second eye. It's been a traumatic cataract or something congenital. And it's been wonderful there as well. It's been giving sort of a little bit of a natural range. It's yeah. been great. Um, I I was going to ask you who would the perfect patient be for an EMV lens, but I, I feel as though we all know that the perfect patient is someone with a pristine eye, everything aligns well. Are there any patients where you would not use an EMV lens? Because I think that's probably the more important question. It, it is a good question. This is adding additional positive spherical collaboration. There are a few clinical contexts where <clears throat> the patient have may already have an, an excess. It's not going to be your routine modern DRK lazy patients where the amount of induced spherical collaboration is, is not much, but it could be one of those very early lazy patients with a small optical zone. Um, some RK patients have a lot of positive spherical aberration. I'd be very cautious, or at least I would take the trouble to measure it before contemplating using an EMV in that context. So there is that small minority where I would say just don't do it or don't do it without making sure that you're not putting additional spherical aberration on someone who's already at the limit. Mm -hmm. One thing that's different with the Ray 1 is the spherical lens has spherical aberration, but it changed with the power of the lens throughout the range. So here you're putting a fixed amount uh, throughout the dioptric range, but there has to be some situations where someone already has too much where you really want to use this lens. That makes sense. Um, people will... Uh be angry with me if I don't ask you this, as you're famous for your group of formulas. Uh, when they're calculating the EMV lens for their patient, should they do anything different to usual? Uh, do you recommend using the TK values, for instance, or um, is there anything to do with your formula that you'd recommend for this lens? There's nothing special. I would... Um want to be sure that they have the right constant then. And I think the company is still accumulating large data and uh, they need to obviously refine it for everyone. And then as an individual surgeon, once you have enough cases, worth refining that yourself. But once you have that constant, then everything you do with formula prediction for another lens, you would follow the same pattern uh, for the right one. That makes sense. Um, you've probably got more results than anyone so far. How are you, what do you think so far? Are you happy with the results? I was very happy with my results. As I said, I'm still at a situation where for me, the toric is precedent. Mm. So I certainly keep me an eye and familiar and privy to, you know, the large amount of data that's been accumulated. And the results uh, are really quite excellent in both subjective patients, satisfaction, et cetera, but also some of the um, depth of focus curves that have been generated. And so um, the lens is performing extremely well. 
in that respect, and also the absence of uh, dysphotopsia. Mm, yeah, that's a big one. People often would like uh, really sort of uh, specific feedback of how to counsel patients for different lenses. And I think we're really good with uh, mono monofocal lenses, saying that you have one good focal point to be crisp and clear, and perhaps diffractive lenses, saying that there'll be a trade-off of halos and glare. How do you counsel a patient in terms of what to expect, especially around spectacle independence? I use, the, uh, if you like, a simplified uh, process for modest minor vision, and I would probably use the same format uh, for Array 1 EMP. Let's call it the ABCD. And uh, A is address the alternatives. So every patient should know that there are different options. And I would then say that monofocal gives you the best quality. There is uh, multifocals, great independence, but some compromise halos, et cetera. And then there's the in-between, which is just an extension of depth, which is probably indistinguishable from monofocal, but you'll gain a bit more range of vision. Uh, B is broach the subject of monovision. Now, in your first meeting, it's very short. You say, if we get your target, never promise your target, mm -hmm. however expert you are. These are pearls of wisdom. I like it. Absolutely. Yeah. You just, and you broach that. If you get your first, then there is a possibility of aiming one eye a bit short-sighted to give you more near vision. And that works well with the extended depth of focus concept. But that conversation begins when we know your outcome. Mm. Um, and so that's very short. Yep. But at least they're aware that there is that option. That very much depends on the outcome of the first hour. And then the C is choose distance in the hour with a denser cataract. Um, ah, that's, a, that's a big one. That. Yeah. yeah. So you wouldn't, uh, I know it's, impossible to ask someone their dominant eye with cataract but yeah. you would choose for them in that situation and absolutely and you really don't have to fret about dominance when you're in the range of about a diopter or one and a quarter one of the reasons for choosing mm -hmm. one and a quarter is dominance really is not an issue at that range and furthermore dominance becomes less of an issue with the ray one because of the greater overlap the foci of the near and the distance eye. Um, and I did have some data which showed that stereo was, it's hard to measure the impact on stereo at minus one and a quarter. And it seems even less with the right one EMV. So monovision is such a poor term for what we're doing. Mm. Blended vision is a term which I would probably encourage uh, in that context. Um, and yeah, so ABCD. Yeah. And then, of course, sorry, the D, I haven't thought you were going <laughs> is, uh, is demonstrate the defocus at that post-op visit after the first eye. So that's the D. And yeah. so when they've got the first eye, do that little trial frame demonstration. Still let them choose. Yeah. Um, I will never, I'll tell them afterwards, I think you made the right choice. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. I won't but don't push them, them into it. Yeah. I will not choose for them. But they can't make the decision until you demonstrate it with that test. And the whole thing then is that the whole process of approaching and advising and uh, is really very brief now. Mm. You're not looking at them and say, well, gosh, I think you're really finicky. I don't think you can have this lens. You're not looking and say, well, you know, he's a truck driver and you know, he's driving. So it simplifies yeah. the whole process compared to when we try to select patients for multifocals. That makes a lot of sense. That's a really good practical pill. Thank you. Now, I'd love to chat for hours, but I think that's probably all the time we have for today. So thank you very much, Professor Barrett, for joining me for a chat about the EMV and your help in developing it. Uh, it's been a real pleasure having a chat. So thank you very much. It's my pleasure, Ben, and uh, such fun. Let's do it again. Sounds great. Thank you. In the next episode of Peer to Peer the Podcast, host Professor Oliver Findle will discuss sustainability with Dr. David Chang. For more information about this episode's topic and to read the show notes, visit the Peer to Peer Hub at rainer.com forward slash peer to peer.
If you enjoyed listening to this conversation, please subscribe to our channel to be notified of new episodes. This podcast is provided for general information purposes only. The presenter's views are their own. Rayner does not endorse off-label use. Users must refer to the product labelling and instructions for use for Rayner products in all cases. Not all Rayner products are available in all countries. The full disclaimer can be found in the show notes.